there are there's so many insurances out there now there uh, with the pharmacy benefits managers being involved you have to deal with them Medicare gets to write all their own laws so when it comes to Medicare um, they wrote themselves out of compounding uh, about two years into Medicare uh, Part D which is the drug coverage uh, they basically they wrote a law that states that Medicare does not have to pay for anything made from bulk chemical which is basically all of compounding so that's how Medicare wrote themselves out um, but an average medication can run uh, anywhere from 80 to 120 to 130 dollars for like a month's supply uh, based on you know what the ingredients how many of the ingre uh, the ingredients were were doing concentrations things of that nature and then another question is um, oh, it's weird. is there any advantage to using a topical NSAID together with an oral product in the same class um, not usually. Um, we usually see one or the other. Uh, we don't see a whole lot of uh, using it both ways, especially when it comes to NSAIDs and their uh, ability to ulcerate stomach lining and cause problems that way and having to go again to a therapeutic level for the whole body uh, to find that anti-inflammatory. It's, it's much more beneficial usually to use that topical anti-inflammatory uh, if the area that we're looking at is appropriate for a topical application. Um, what kind of research evidence do you look for before you say okay to try a compound formulation? Um, a part of the, the uh, information that you guys have access to is I think about seven, I don't know, it's 50 to 60 pages of, of nothing but um, uh, links to research articles and abstracts. Um, so as far as that part of it goes, these are all very well researched, as Dr. Fishman said. We, we work with um, uh, other pharmacists, uh, PhDs in chemistry, MDs that all are involved in this kind of compounding community. Uh, and so we have a lot of different people, uh, access to a lot of different people. Uh, but we're looking with, at, at good evidence-based medicine, just like you are. Um, at times, though, there are those ones where we'll get a phone call and say, I want to try this. We do the bunch of research. We don't really see where it's, uh, uh, you know, been researched out and have you know, done all these studies on it, but you know, the thought will make sense. The 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 ability to, you know, when once we all think it through, it's like okay, yeah, I could see where we can try that, and that's the beauty of it is we can try some of these things. Sometimes you're the first, and and there, there's nothing wrong with that as long as we're not doing damage or going with some crazy high dose or something like that. So Dorothy gives you an example. Uh, what if a provider asks for CBD oil and ketamine in a patch? So compounding pharmacies usually don't make patches. It's a very involved process that has to work just right, right? And that patch has to have enough medication coming out, you know, just at the right time, over a period of time and all of that. Also, in the state of California, um, pharmacies can't work with CBD. Uh, even if it's purely uh, hemp extract, the Farm Act did not exempt um, uh, pharmacies from working with CBD. So unfortunately, we would lose our uh, federal licenses uh, because it is still federally scheduled uh, one. Um, so the pro that's a problem there. Uh, definitely make sure you're asking your patients about CBD, whether they're using it topically or orally, because a lot of patients are out there using it. Some, especially the older patients, feel uh, they feel like there's a, a you know a negative associated with it, or they, they don't want to tell their doctor that they're doing this. Um, and um, you know, really make sure it's a very effective anti-inflammatory. Um, but the problem is with a lot of these commercially available products uh, with the CBDs, whether it's zero THC or has THC in it, it doesn't really matter. A lot of them, people are putting them in these like really waxy bases. Uh, they're putting them in, you know, petrolatum, things that will not allow it to drive at all. So you're really getting no <coughs> penetration. And so very, very few of those commercially available CBD products really work to any appreciable level. Um, basically, you want to go as pure as possible on that, and usually an oil uh, that is rubbed in 
uh, is going to be better than some of these ones that have all these strange, odd bases. So I have, I have a couple questions for you. Um, uh, can you just say a few words, just for those who might not be familiar, about the differences between topical and transdermal and the different carriers that you would consider in terms of reaching each of those goals? Yeah, so topical, much more um, obviously surface uh, area usage, um, uh, skin, um, you know, so we see it in dermatology, uh, topical use, um, uh, things of, of that nature. Um, transdermal is driving across and then re releasing it, and so we get deeper penetration. Uh, oftentimes, that's what's being used to try to penetrate into, uh, you know, somebody's shoulder, into the back, into wherever we're trying to get that into. Uh, and so we see uh, with transdermal application, a little higher level uh, of active pharmaceutical ingredient at at that injury site versus staying more topical on the. On the skin and the skin structure um, and uh, there are certain things that they use for that um, some of the um, counter irritants and things of that nature that will kind of irritate the skin enough capsations and things of this nature that will and then will cause a bit of heat and and you know menthol and camphor uh, those types of things that can uh, uh, cause a little heat, a little warmth, and sometimes that feels very good for a, a patient's uh, use and that's all they need. Uh, other times we really need an anti-inflammatory to get in there and, dr and drive down that inflammation. Um, I know that you have a lot of choices of carriers. Yes, as far as carriers go, there are all sorts of different carriers uh, uh, based on the chemistry of the ingredient. If it's really uh, fat soluble fat loving like if, for instance uh, hormones uh, if we were to give a like a testosterone or an estrogen hormone uh, and wanted to use it transdermally uh, we can do that and get it across the skin and into the system using something uh, like there's a product called VersaBase or Lipoderm these are uh, proprietary bases but, uh, that I have nothing to do with um, and they drive the medication uh, into the system and that's for transdermal application. We can see, we can uh, take blood levels, we can see that the levels are increasing of whatever we're putting in. Um, but if you have something like, say, a lichen sclerosis on a female patient and you wanted a topical testosterone uh, to be used on that, you can then put it into something like petrolatum, uh, something that's very heavy oil because they're fat soluble and they love fat and they just want to stay there uh, and not drive across so uh, one could put that uh, into a, a use like testosterone in, in ointment base and then they could apply that to the lichen sclerosis you know a couple of times a day and it much more works topically uh, than it does uh, transdermally we're not seeing the testosterone levels go up if we were to um, uh, you know, you know, get a blood sample on them or something. It's, it's definitely working uh, at the topical application site. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. I think you can continue with your presentation. Yeah. <laughs> well, so the, 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 the hard part about, um, when, when speaking about compounding, is that it's just so all-encompassing. I mean, it, it really, we can take, so if you have patients that are going through radiation, head and neck cancer, things of this nature, so we'll do, um, uh, magic mouthwashes. Uh, so we'll take things like Maalox and lidocaine and Benadryl and sometimes sucrophate uh, and mix them all up and use it as a swish and spit or a swish and swallow. Um, and they'll do anywhere from five to 15 mLs and they'll gargle with it several times a day. Um, we can use antivirals <coughs> in the medication if we think it's a viral thing that's going on. Um, but we get lots of, of the, uh, the magic mouthwashes. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, uh, formulas for things like magic mouthwash. Every doctor has something different. Some like hydrocortisone in it, some like tetracycline in it, some like doxycycline in it. Doxycycline and tetracycline can be a little um, uh, rough. Uh, you would want to uh, make sure uh, on those ones that we get a little bit of water down the pipe afterwards because it can ulcerate uh, the esophagus and just left there. So uh, we have to be careful with those. 
Uh, but yeah, magic mouthwashes are something that we see all the way, like I said, from cancer all the way to little infants where they'll swab them and paint, basically they paint the mouth um, for kids that have like hand, foot, and mouth uh, going on or some viral thing that will cause the blistering uh, both internally and externally in the oral mucosa uh, and so they'll just kind of get the stuff and dab it on and paint it on so if you're working with pediatrics we can do a, a lot of that uh, we see a lot of the three to ones lahiacane and malox where they'll drink that down when they uh, presented an emergency room with terrible gastric pain and, and things of that nature um, we try to stay away, uh, you want to keep your patients uh, away from drinking lidocaine as much as possible. We lose that gag reflex really rapidly uh, and then it becomes uh, problematic if people, you know, they can aspirate and have problems there. Also, if you have your cardiac patients, you do have to be careful uh, when it comes to lidocaine toxicity uh, and so we, we uh, have to stay away from that. If you're using lidocaine topically, we don't want to uh, talk to our patients uh, ab about trying to enhance the penetration. There are bases and, and vehicles now that really drive the medication in uh, as far as it needs to go. Uh, there were two deaths uh, several years ago where uh, a gentleman uh, was running a uh, a laser hair treatment clinic and he would give these women uh, lidocaine to smear all over their legs about an hour before they came in and then they would wrap their legs in saran wrap uh, to enhance the penetration and two of them died from uh, uh, you know, yeah, a lidocaine toxicity uh, because they just drove it in so we, we don't really need to enhance the penetration we always tell patients when they're working with topicals uh, not to put anything uh, over it, uh, like a bandage or, or cellophane or anything like that, that the base will take care of that. Obviously clothing, all of that is more than appropriate. No, no issues there. You can get contact transference when it comes to these types of medications. So if you're using a lot of them, they're applying a lot of them, they have to be careful uh, when you know going skin to skin contact with anybody uh, and and animals as well. They had a, there was a, a, a unfortunate study that came about where uh, these women that were living in a board and care facility were using topical estrogen. They were applying it to their forearms. Right after they would apply it, the little lap dogs would hop up on their laps and all their lap dogs ended up with breast cancer because they were all just sitting on their forearms that they had just coated with estrogen and they were getting this contact transference. And so, um, so it, can happen. We have to be careful when applying it. You would want to use gloves. Um, if you're using it on yourself, it's not quite as bad, but still we might as well get all the app, all the medication applied where we want it to, um, rather than on fingertips and all that kind of stuff. And, and people, you know, we're all human. We accidentally forget about it.